Now that you've learned more about the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis, it's time to move on and discuss how multiple sclerosis is diagnosed. As always, if you have any questions about this topic, do not hesitate to reach out to me by email or schedule a meeting with me in Calendly. MS is often difficult to recognize at initial presentation because many of the signs and symptoms are potentially related to a number of different disease states. However, there are a few symptoms that present initially with higher frequency than others, and so those are the ones that we will focus on. The initial exacerbation or presentation of MS is typically an episode of paresthesia. Paresthesias are numbness or tingling in the extremities. Fatigue, diplopia, which is double vision or other vision problems disequilibrium or walking difficulty, and also sometimes bladder dysfunction. More often than not, the initial exacerbation or flare of MS will present with one of those symptoms. There are other signs that may occur either at initial presentation or at some point later in the disease course during a subsequent flare. And these are things like abnormal gait, sexual dysfunction, vertigo or dizziness, impaired speech, muscle spasms or weakness, and cognitive dysfunction. In summary, the key signs or symptoms to commit to memory are paresthesias, vision problems, and walking difficulty. The clinical signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis directly correlate with the location in the brain of the plaques or lesions that have occurred. The majority of patients with MS present with what is known as a mixed presentation. About 50% of patients have this type of presentation. And that means that there are lesions both in the central nervous system in the brain as well as in the spinal cord. The symptoms that are associated with this type of presentation are wide ranging and affect a lot of different functions given that the lesions are occurring in both the brain and the spinal cord. You may observe things like optic neuritis, which is inflammation of the optic nerve, diplopia or double vision, vertigo or dizziness, nystagmus or involuntary eye movements, as well as signs that involve the cerebellar function. And these include things such as abnormal speech, swallowing, hearing, and gait. About 30 to 40% of patients present with a more spinal focused presentation. And these are individuals who have lesions primarily in the spinal cord. The main signs and symptoms in these individuals are muscle weakness, incontinence, and muscle spasticity. And finally, a small subset of patients, about 5%, present with a cerebellar primary presentation. These are patients who have lesions primarily in the cerebellum of the brain or the brain stem. And the primary signs and symptoms associated with this presentation are abnormal speech, swallowing, hearing, or gait. MS can be subdivided into one of four categories of clinical course. A clinical course has to do with the pattern of relapse or exacerbation and then remission or disease-free periods. The most common clinical course at initial presentation is what is known as relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis or RRMS. This is characterized by acute attacks or exacerbations with either full or partial recovery in between attacks. There's typically no lasting disability 
or progression in between attacks in this clinical course. The second most common clinical course at diagnosis is primary progressive MS or PPMS. This course is characterized by steady worsening of the MS condition from the onset of disease with no remission in between exacerbations and worsening of the disease state over time, along with lasting disability. And lastly, the least common clinical course at initial diagnosis is progressive relapsing MS or PRMS. This is characterized as steadily progressive from the onset of the disease with the additional occurrence of exacerbations or attacks that might partially remit, but there is steadily progressing disease severity over time as well. There is another clinical course called secondary progressive MS or SPMS. Patients may not be diagnosed with SPMS at initial presentation. However, a large majority of individuals with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis will eventually progress to secondary progressive, where the disease becomes more steadily progressive with continued worsening disability over time. About 90% of patients with relapsing remitting MS will progress to secondary progressive within 10 to 20 years of diagnosis. The graphic shown here depicts the distribution of those various clinical courses of MS. As I mentioned, relapsing remitting is by far the most common clinical course at initial presentation, with upwards of 80% of patients being characterized as relapsing remitting. About 10% of patients are characterized as primary progressive at initial presentation, and even fewer, less than 5%, are characterized as progressive relapsing at presentation. There are three primary criteria that must be met in order for a diagnosis of MS to be made. The first is that there has to be at least two episodes or symptoms that have occurred. These episodes or symptom identifications have to be separated in time by at least one month, and each episode has to last at least 24 hours. Episodes can be identified clinically by signs and symptoms, or they may be identified using imaging technology to identify lesions in the brain. The primary imaging modality used to evaluate lesions in patients with MS is magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. MRI can detect two different types of lesions. The first group are called T2 lesions, and these are lesions of any age. They can be old or new. Also using a contrast enhancing dye, gadolinium, MRI can detect gadolinium enhanced lesions, and these are new active lesions that are currently undergoing inflammatory damage. It is important to note that MRI can detect both types of lesions as the characterization of a patient in terms of their clinical course and severity depends on the number of T2 versus gadolinium enhanced lesions. Other assessments that can be made in patients with MS is cerebrospinal fluid analysis or CSF analysis. Looking for things like blood cells, total protein, and IgG in the brain, which are all elevated in patients with MS. CSF is typically collected using lumbar puncture and then can be evaluated using a blood count, protein analysis, or immunoglobulin analysis. Optic nerve function is evaluated using one of two techniques, either visual evoked potential, VEP, or optical coherence tomography, OCT. And a patient's disability is evaluated using a survey that is called Expanded Disability Status Scale, or EDSS. Once a patient is diagnosed with MS, 
Unfortunately, their prognosis is not easy to predict as it depends on a number of patient factors as well as what treatment interventions are utilized. However, in general, it is optimistic to note that the life expectancy of individuals with MS is not greatly altered compared to individuals without MS. Individuals typically have a better prognosis, a better than average or more fair prognosis if they are female, if the disease onset occurs before the age of 40, if the attacks or exacerbations are infrequent, and if they are classified as having relapsing remitting MS as the clinical course. The reverse of that uh, would indicate a more poor prognosis. So an individual who is male, onset after age 40, who has frequent attacks, or who is classified as primary progressive would be thought to have a worse or poorer prognosis. Again, now is a good time to pause and review what you've learned about the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Take a moment to consider why CSF blood cells, protein, and IgG are all increased in individuals with MS. Why does this make sense, given the pathophysiology of the disease? If you need some additional help answering this question, snap a pic of the QR code for additional resources.